Hello, and welcome back to Build. I'm your host, Tatiana Pyle, and today I'm sitting down with the producer and subjects of HBO's latest documentary, We Are the Dream. We Are the Dream focuses on the Oakland Unified School District's MLK Oratorical Festival in California as the students prepare for the 40th annual competition. The film reveals the deep connection the students make between King's words and the world they live in today. Please help me in welcoming director and producer Amy Schatz, executive producer Julie Anderson, and student Gregory Payton, and educator Zarita Sharp. Yes, welcome to New York. How are you guys doing today? Good. Good. That clip was so amazing. I mean, Gregory, you killed it. How are you feeling coming off of this competition? I feel great. Um, I feel wonderful. And I'm glad that I got to be a part of it. And I got to um, do a speech and pay a tribute to Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Absolutely. And how fitting that is during Black History Month, you're able to share such a historical moment in our history and channel in that energy. How was this experience for you? Was it your first time in the competition? Yes. Were you nervous? Yes. I honestly couldn't tell. You did so amazing. And you had a great educator supporting and encouraging you throughout the way. Yes. Thank you. Of course. Zarita, how was the experience for you pushing him and pushing him to be, obviously, as great as he was throughout the clips? Amazing. Um, wonderful. Uh, as an educator, I, um, you work. I worked with Gregory. And then you have to step back. I have to step back. And so when I step back and just release and... What he does is just, as a child orator, is magical. It's this work by HBO is, I believe it's something is sacred. Why now at this time, um, Gregory and myself are here, and we are going to be speaking to an audience through HBO's work all over the United States. And to see him, and I just want to share, once I step back, um, you'll see moments where I'm crying. So there are times where the HBO documentary is the first time for me to see him. Because sometimes I do get very full and I don't remember <laughs> what he did yeah. when I see him live. So the film is special. The experience with him, with his family, to trust me with their child, to have the honor by uh, the principal of Piedmont Avenue Elementary School, Zarina Ahmad, who asked me to coach for the 40th annual. It's just such a pleasure, such a joy. Absolutely. And Julie and Amy, I'm curious as to why now? Why tell the story of these students doing this amazing thing? Like, what was the significance for you all to choose to partake in this documentary? Um, well, I think maybe, Julie, you can speak about the origin of the project, and then I can speak about the documentary. The, the idea really came from Julie, so. Yeah, sure. Um, you know, 2018 was the 50th anniversary of Martin Luther King's assassination. And I was working on a film um, about Martin Luther King. And as part of my research, of course, I read everything I could read. And I read um, Dr. King's autobiography. And he tells a story in his autobiography that was very meaningful for him. He said he had gone to an oratory competition. He was 14 years old, and he won. And on the way back, he and his teacher had to ride 90 miles in the bus standing up because there were no more seats for black people on the bus. And that struck him so much so that that is a very special story he tells in his autobiography about the birth of his, his, his career as a person fighting for civil rights. And so I started looking online for other oratory competitions and um, it turned out there were a lot of children doing it. And it was amazing how inspiring it was to watch kids talking about equality, justice, freedom um, from nine-year-olds. 
And so I, I wrote up a little proposal and sent it to HBO because I know that this is right in line with the kinds of things HBO likes to do. And Amy happened to be available. She's an amazing director. And I, one of Amy's true strengths is her ability to get children in particular relaxed in front of the camera. And casting and finding the right people to put in front of the cameras, you can see from the film that she did an amazing job at that. Thank you. So why now? Um, my, my producing partner, Diane Collier, and I um, researched other oratorical competitions and found Oakland and found this incredibly rich, beautiful community um, event, which is the annual oratorical competition in, in Oakland. And we were blown away by it. We, the mix of poetry, the mix of original speeches, famous speeches, just the, the also the, the thinking about Martin Luther King and thinking about what his words mean is deeply a part of um, the idea behind the oratorical. And we, we just, we were blown away by it and we thought this place is magic. It has, Oakland has this history of social, social justice movements and that was really interesting to us. And I think when we got there, we thought we were making a film about a contest. We thought, oh, we'll, we'll film everything and we'll find the winner and we'll follow the winner and there'll be this nail biting mm -hmm. you know, kind of um, documentary. And when we were there, we realized that something deep was going on, that it, we needed to create space in the film for these deep, meaningful um, pieces by the kids, um, pieces that were about the, the world we live in, immigration, um, social justice, um, racism, um, gun violence, you know, so many of the issues of today were in this. And listening to the kids, hearing what they had to say, hearing not only their outrage, but also their ideas for changing the world was deeply inspiring and moving. So that really, it, it was both about Martin Luther King and his legacy, but also about today. Absolutely, I think that was one of the most powerful um, stories throughout the documentary, focusing on the community of Oakland and how it has so much historical context behind it. And also the children who come from diverse backgrounds. They weren't just black kids, they were kids of color. There were also white kids who were involved too. And I thought that was extremely moving to see that these the kids, the next generation who's going to lead the world, how they have such vast and vivid dreams for change. And they understand some of the things that happened prior to their existence and you know how it affected us now. And I thought that was extremely powerful. And Gregory, there was a moment um, in the film without giving too much away when you go to your church home and everyone in the community is talking about how much of a leader you are and who you are becoming. And I thought that was incredible. And you probably didn't even realize that prior to watching the film. How was it seeing people speak so highly of you? Well, watching that I was Amazed, I um, I was so glad that people were saying um, good things, and um, I liked watching them talk about me, and um, <laughs> I enjoyed it a lot. Absolutely. What was your favorite part throughout the entire documentary? The part with me in it. <laughs> <laughs> Naturally, right? How how do you feel like the pressure was for you outside of going in the competition, but now you have cameras surrounding you? Did you feel any of that at all? No. You are a true natural, and you can take my job when you're my age, I promise. <laughs> why did you choose a already, well, why did you choose one of MLK's speeches versus creating your own? Well, um, when I was at my school, Piedmont Avenue, um, I... Miss Sharp here. Um, she saw the. She saw that I would be good at this, so she asked me if I wanted to do it, and I said yes. And then um, we would be working together, and um, she chose the speech for me, and um, we was we were working together to um, rehearse the speech. Sometimes I would call her over the weekend and we would um, rehearse the speech um, for about 10 minutes and um, we kept doing it over and over. Well, practice clearly made perfect. Now, Ms. Sharp, I wanna switch, over to, switch gears over to you and just talk about 
your involvement with these kids, uplifting them and helping them achieve this goal. Now, a lot of times in schools, we focus a lot on maybe the arts or sports or um, math or science, things like that, and don't really focus on this talent, which is public speaking, because it's very hard to do, especially with confidence and um, elegance in which a lot of them were able to achieve. How was that for you, helping them to achieve this goal? So for me, um, to emulate Dr. King, um, who I, in my perspective, is one of the greatest orators of the 20th century. And the bar is high. But then that's what we do as educators. That's what I do. I'm an elementary educator, so I teach children from K through fifth grade, basically. I am retired at this time. Uh, over the years, it's a connection to education. The founder, Donald Oliver, had that vision. He saw this venture, this venue that children needed as something that really showcases their eclectic sense of talent, academia. And because the pieces are so powerful, because the discipline that is required, the practice, as you just said, practice makes perfect. And so we work together, the parents, it's a family affair. Uh, the, ch the child orator, the student, as, as I also say, the parent and myself, and we continue to prepare. And they can take that same discipline into writing. You know, many times children have to rewrite, rewrite, rewrite. Um, and it can get pretty frustrating, but that's all part of it. And so it's, it's a joy. It's, um, it is work. But the, the, the biggest joy is you never know as a teacher what they're going to do. There's that moment when you have to, I have to step back. And he, Gregory, he just amazed me. And, and, and what I'm, for me, what I'm looking at when I see him is high African culture. That, that culture that understands that words touch the hearts of the speaker as well as the listener. And Dr. King, he represents all of that. Absolutely. And one thing that you noted that I think it's important to touch on, too, is just reaching a new type of talent that students can tap into. Right. Um, have you noticed throughout your time of actually being involved in this project that you've seen a difference in kids as far as like accessing different parts of talent that they may be that they may have had that they didn't realize? Yes, I've seen them. Um, this piece that Gregory does is uh, was compiled by me 10 years ago. So there are other children, some of those children like uh, Dejanay, Elijah, Satera, and Agadis, some of them range in age from 17 to 12 now. And I've had the chance to see them venture out into other areas. One youngster is very much into sports. Other children, they're writers. Some of the children that you'll see, and one of the little girls in the uh, documentary is a child author in Oakland. So the experience provides them with um, creativity that branches out into other disciplines. And it's just marvelous. It really is. It's, it's something to see. So what's the time frame of this project from the creation of deciding that the students want to be involved mm -hmm. to the actual competition? What does that look like? So. It varies with each teacher. For me, I started at the beginning of the school year. And I would teach children how to orate. So we might start with an affirmation in the morning, constantly reciting, just putting words out, reciting words, learning how to articulate. Um, and then when we prepare for a piece that we agree that we're going to do, one of the things I have, I've always done is I learn the piece myself so that I can model it. And um, so it can take anywhere from the beginning of the year, it could t where a teacher start, or you can start, um, because the oratorical is held in 
January at the site level and then moves into the semifinals and then finals. So sometimes teachers will start in November preparing. Yeah. I love that you said that you've learned the speeches with them as well. I thought it was just so beautiful seeing that some of the parents and some of the other educators in the crowds were just mouthing along to yes. them. Like you can tell yes. the passion. You can tell how excited everybody is about this um, contest and the community. It's such a bonding moment for everyone involved. And that was so beautiful. And Amy and Julie, I am curious because I think one of the most beautiful things about this thing is that the kids are so eloquent, so articulate, and I'm sure that was a little difficult in the beginning to capture on camera. Like, what were some of the challenges and then what were some of the ways you were able to actually engage with the kids in order to get them to open up? Well, I um, think that all kids are eloquent and they've got it in them, so I'm a big believer in listening to kids. I think they're deep thinkers. Um, and they have a lot to offer us. So I think there's not any tricks really in, in eliciting that from kids. It's really just deep listening. You know, if you listen carefully enough, you um, kids give you treasures. So um, I would just say that, you know, early on, we had the privilege of being in the, in the classroom while they were doing this early work. And, you know, the session between the two of them is featured in the film early on, and you can see the progression from the beginning to the end. And I think one of the things that I noticed is that Gregory is very quiet in the beginning. Um, and by the end, this is a picture of him um, orating, by the end he's fully, um, uh, he transports us and he's transported. So I think there's a magic that happens the teachers, the coaches, the families working with these kids, loving them, supporting them, celebrating them, that really they lose that, um, they have it still, but they lose that self-consciousness. Um, so the challenge of filming with kids is that I feel like you want to include as much as possible, right? And there were hundreds of kids in this. So um, our our challenge was how do we fit all this in, um, and we, you know, we did the best we could. <laughs> um, well, I think one of the extraordinary messages from that film is, as you said, this is the next generation, and I love seeing the, this young generation coming up at five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten years old with these ideas already about equality and justice and social change, and uh, I think they feel empowered by having their words go out there and having people really listen so rapidly. And remember, this happens every year. It wasn't there just because our cameras were there. So I, I just feel it, that it's so inspiring me, to me to see this younger generation. There's so much hate in this world, and you hear it every day on the news, and it's so, you know, sometimes you just feel so so much in despair. And this, to me, is really enlightening and gives me hope, in essence, for our future. And it really does feel like a rise up moment for kids. Mm -hmm. um, you know, kids are, um, whether it be the movement around gun violence or the movement around climate change, we're listening as a society to our kids. And they are, um, they realize they have a voice. and. The competition is an extension of that, I think, the climate of um, kids having something to say about this specific moment in time that we're all on this earth. And it's, and it's inspiring. And going back just for a second to what Amy was saying, HBO is putting, you know, the film is edited very tightly, and we meant to bring it in at an hour, but there's so much that was left that HBO is posting a lot of the full speeches on the website. Yeah, I, I wish we could have seen all the students. I didn't even realize there were so many different categories until the end when the awards were being handed out. I'm like, oh, there were so many more speeches we didn't get to see. Gregory, are you going to participate next year? What's What does the next year look like for you? Well, sadly, I'm not going to participate next year because um, I attend a new school in Vallejo, and Vallejo does not do the Martin Luther King Jr. Oratorical Fest. Oh, Well, can you bring it to your school? I, I will try. 
Okay. I'm going to hold you to that one, okay? And one last thing that I really wanted to um, talk about that I thought was also equally as important that was inserted in here. We, in the film, we talk a lot about of, like, of the historical movements, the Black Panther, MLK. But you guys also included something very relevant to um, the social media age when it, in regards to civil rights, the Starbucks incident. And I thought that was extremely important. And I'm just curious as to um, what was the decision-making process behind choosing to include that moment? Um, well, Donovan um, was very, very affected by that. Um, that incident, and he, we filmed a conversation that he had with his father in which they were talking about um, how the Starbucks incident and that um, it, the experience of bias and racism is something that hit home for them. And I think this, the conversation that ensued between Donovan and his father about raising a black boy in this country felt very heart-wrenching and relevant and resonant. And we wanted to include it because um, it was something that he experienced in his life and in the world and made it into a speech about um, doing good in the world. And so he took that incident and his conclusion in his speech is really, how about um, we raise each other up? instead of knock each other down. Mm -hmm. And it just seemed beautiful and, and, um, and reflective of our time. Absolutely. And again, thank you guys so much for coming. We do have some questions from the audience. So the first one is right here. Hi, thank you all for being here. Um, so my question is, what was the most surprising part of the filmmaking process with this project? Anybody? Should I? Yeah, go ahead. Amy. Okay. So I alluded to it, which is that in the beginning, we really thought we were making a comp contest film and mm -hmm. we're going to see oh, there's a winner in the end. And that became completely irrelevant. So that was a surprise. We, we had to shift our thinking a little bit that it didn't matter right. that there, you know, everybody was a winner. So, you know, that was a filmmaking um, revelation, really. Um, and the other surprise for me was there's a boy from Sri Lanka who, um, when I was interviewing him, he mentioned that he was new to this country, um, a new immigrant, and that he hadn't heard of MLK. And so when he heard Martin, uh, the Dr. King's name, he thought, I have to research this person. And what he discovered and the beauty of, the, of uh, Martin Luther King's teachings and the the ideas about peace and conflict resolution really um, was mind opening for him and led him to write a speech about conflict in his native country. So that was just thinking about how Dr. King can influence somebody today. And if you read his words, it can touch you deeply. That became a moment during the filmmaking when my team and I thought, oh, you know, this is also about Dr. King, this film. I will say that the footage, there's a clip in the film of Dr. King speaking to children, which we never see. You know, we always see Dr. King um, in the civil rights protest ad addressing adults. And the footage of him in the film talking to kids really struck me because he was, you know, he was already there inspiring young people. And I, I don't think we really think about that very much, that he was really focused on young people as well as people of his own age. And I'd like to share that what was, I won't say it was surprising, but amazing the way HBO highlights relationships in the documentary. That is a theme that stands out so poignantly in this work. Don't, 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 don't. <laughs> to see fathers with their children, to hear a mother say, I told my son he has to speak from his heart. She said, you can speak from your mouth, but unless it comes from here, you, 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 you have to come from here. And that's our transformation. That's when the children have arrived. As was pointed out, Gregor was very quiet. Once it comes from the heart and not just from here, 
then you know the transformation has happened. And that child, that speaker, has been touched as well as touching others. So the relationships that this documentary, which is so unique, that's why I say it's sacred work. And we have one more question. Hi, thank you for being here and congratulations. I was wondering, what do you hope young audiences take away from watching this project? I think I want to see more families going to church, to temple, to synagogue, to mosque, to be that light that the children are. When that child said, I am from a place where I was a language minority, <laughs> um, when he said he hadn't seen his grandfather, for him as a, a youngster, I want this country to hear them and to act with some action. That's, that's what Dr. King was about. And I said earlier, this is about high culture, high African culture. High culture intersects with all cultures. And so that's why he was able to connect Dr. King to himself. It's embracing. And, and that's the message. That's what I want. Um, I want the listeners, the viewers, to take that with them. And I want to see a transformation in, in the behavior that is here in our country. Because we need help right now. We're not in a good place. And our children are telling us, and out of the mouth of babes, they're showing us the way. They really are. Well, thank you all again so much for coming and speaking with us. And We Are the Dream officially premieres on HBO February 18th, 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you.